I'm going to be telling you about the work we're doing around Chicago on different wildlife species. Uh, I was going to say that I feel a little bit out of place because, uh, A, I'm a terrestrial ecologist, so I, I don't work in rivers. I work near rivers. And B, I don't really rewild anything. So, uh, but you're stuck with me, anyway. So, <laughs> I'll tell you about the work that we're doing around Chicago, much of which does relate to the Chicago River system, anyway. Um, so yeah, as I said, I direct a, a relatively new research center called the Urban Wildlife Institute that's housed in the Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, and uh, so I don't know how many of you work with people at zoos that do field conservation. Most zoos do a significant amount of field conservation anymore, but so I have colleagues that work in the Congo, right? They work in the Willowa Triangle, and they work in the, the only place in the world, actually, where chimps and gorillas coexist with each other. They work where Jane Goodall worked. They have all these amazing stories about going to the Congo and how um, you know, amazing and pristine and natural it is. And then across the hall from them, I have other colleagues. They work in Tanzania, in Serengeti National Park, and they work on rhinos. Uh, we do a very cool project where we vaccinate dogs uh, out there, which actually protects wildlife and people from rabies. So they're out there, they're saving lives, they're sort of helping all these people and breaking down cultural barriers. Um, I work here. <laughs> so uh, we're actually sitting in the middle of my study area. Um, I'm, the, I'm the local guy at the zoo, and I work in Chicago, and I work on species that are probably less exotic to all of you, a little, uh, a little less um, maybe exciting to some people, things like foxes and squirrels. So constantly I'm feeling the question, uh, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> why is the zoo interested in these uh, animals that many people, can, you know, obviously aren't, aren't endangered, that many people consider a nuisance? Why is it important to actually do research in a highly modified area like, like in Chicago? So what I like to remind people is that it's kind of funny, right? People become wildlife biologists largely so they can work in places like Tanzania and the Congo. And as a result, actually we usually know more about those ecosystems, how they work, how their species behave and adapt their environment than we do about the area right in our own backyard. There's this curious ecological blind spot uh, that exists in cities, which is where we tend to actually train our ecologists. Um, often we don't know really basic things about urban species, things like how do they survive? <coughs> Uh, what do they do all day? How does their behavior shift uh, as they live in urban environments? And then critically in urban areas, how do people actually feel about sharing space with wildlife? Why do they feel that way? And how does all of this change over time? As our world continues to urbanize, as animals adapt to people, as people adapt to animals, as we all sort of uh, exist together in this ever-changing system, how can we predict what happens next? How can we predict the future for people and wildlife? So let's talk about coyotes for a little while. They're kind of interesting. Uh, we have a species here that most people don't traditionally think of as urban, right? Not like a pigeon or a squirrel. Uh, and yet, they're increasing in urban areas all across North America. And sometimes they do really weird things. Uh, like this animal in 2008 who walked into, or 2007, who walked into a Quiznos here in the loop um, and sat down next to the beverage cooler. <laughs> Why would she do that? <laughs> we have no idea. It seems baffling, right, to us. Like, I can't make up a story as to why that would make sense. But somehow, animals are not irrational as a rule. Somehow, in that moment, that was the decision that made sense to her. If we understood better how it is that animals change their behavior to live in urban areas, we might be able to figure that out. And there's all kinds of stories about coyotes around a tree. You've all seen them in the news and in different articles, and I, I sort of collect all these different news stories. I really like this one. Um, not so much for the story, although the story was pretty good. But I really enjoyed the comment section, and you guys probably can't read those, so I'll read them, some of them to you. Uh, the top comment here is by CJ. Uh, CJ, he or she says, I'm intrigued by all the interest in the coyotes. Where I live on the far northwest side, I'd rather see more of them. They do a good job of controlling the small animal and even some of the deer population. Feel free to watch them and report on them. Just don't capture them. So CJ is very positive. CJ has a little misinformation. They don't the deer population, but that's okay. Um, CJ thinks they do, and that, that's a good thing. So we scroll down five or six people to Mike, and Mike says, they should kill it. These animals are the worst predator in the Chicago area. Absolutely no use for them. When I'm hunting, I try to kill every one I see. Just ask someone whose pet was killed by one. So Mike and CJ have had different experiences with coyotes. <laughs> and they perhaps indicate the gulf that we all have living in urban areas, right? We, we don't necessarily agree about what should be done with these species. What, what is their role here? Do they belong here? What can we do about it? Um, and a lot of it is misinformation. And uh, this is, the zoo is not immune to all of this. So this is a construction project we did at the zoo about five years ago that I'll tell you more about in a little while. And in the middle of it, uh, this, this coyote showed up walking around, and uh, that's when I got to find out that 
The zoo also does not agree about whether there should be wild animals roaming around our zoo. Understandably, we have many uh, different endangered and threatened species in our collection, some of whom coyotes could be a threat to. Um, so we were monitoring the situation pretty closely, and then we encountered this burrow just north of the zoo in the lily pond, actually, in the park district. And um, we thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, being thinking ourselves clever mammals, we, uh, we put a camera on it. And we got some pretty cool footage of her, and she's kind of hanging out, being an urban coyote. And she comes over to investigate the camera for a second. <laughs> So we thought that was pretty cool, and we went on monitoring this camera for a while, and then what happened, so if you see her, watch closely here when she comes in from the right, she looks super pregnant, and she's going into the burrow. They usually only do that when they're getting ready to give birth. So we were super excited to see little Kyle pops in her. But then the next set of footage that we had from this camera was this. So, what happened? If a raccoon moves into a coyote burrow in an urban area, will the coyotes abandon it? Do they have backup burrows? Well, can a raccoon actually chase a coyote out of its den? Would a raccoon actually eat newborn coyote pups? I don't have the answers to any of these questions. We don't really know how coyotes and raccoons interact in urban areas. Again, this is one of our big blank spots in our knowledge. So to try to learn more, we actually teamed up with a biologist from Ohio State, Dr. Stan Garrett, who uh, studies coyotes and urbanization, and uh, we trapped an animal, maybe that female, we, we have no way to know. Uh, we trapped an animal at the zoo, Coyote 441, and this is her being brought back to the zoo, and we attached her with her a GPS-enabled radio collar, so if you guys know how these work, um, they're pretty cool. You actually have to buy them a cell phone plan, just like your cell phone, <laughs> and then they text you periodically, and they tell you where the animal is. Uh, so we got about three months' worth of data from this animal, um, and we created this map. So on this map, each of these little red dots is somewhere that she was located over that three month period. Wow. So you can see a big profusion of points here at the zoo, and this is museum campus. She really likes those spots. Um, but you can also see she's roaming all the way up past Evanston, clear down south beyond downtown. She's covering a ton of ground. So this is sort of a cool map, but we can actually also uh, do science at it and learn some things about how coyotes actually may choose to use different parts of the city. So we did that, and we ended up with this graph. So we were looking at what sorts of areas does she avoid and what sorts of areas does she use during the day and at night. So during the day, her most preferred sites were warehousing and distribution centers and open space centers. And this kind of makes sense to me because I think if you're a coyote in Chicago during the day, all you need want is somewhere to sleep where there are not people around walking around and bothering you. And warehouses actually probably fit that bill, actually. At night, she's all about, well, as we all are, cultural and entertainment. <laughs> um, I think this represents the zoo and the museum campus, which if you think about it at night, is probably just a big lawn filled with rabbits. So this is probably a very good thing. To and then also lakes, reservoirs, and lagoons, again, places where you can go and hunt. So, breaking the city down like this to actually see the kinds of areas she uses and avoids, then what we can do is we can turn around and make a map where we try to envision the city the way a coyote might see it. We created this map where the more green areas, those are the areas that she uh, preferred, the, the used areas, and then the more, the more red it is, the more it's avoided. Um, when you create a map like this, now we're being predictive, right? Now we can actually make predictions, even to the parts of the city where we don't have data, to say, where would we expect to see a lot of coyotes? Where would we not expect to see coyotes? And if we increase green space, if we decrease green space, if we change our road system, we can actually predict how the coyote population will react. We can get basically one step out ahead of them. This is the same map, but at night, and you can see that a lot more of the city is sort of greeny, yellowy at night. Um, this is because we know that in urban areas, uh, the most major threat to coyotes is, is cars. They get hit by cars quite a bit. Um, so they have adapted to be more nocturnal to avoid those roads and traffic. And at night, they sort of move relatively freely around the city, but during the day, uh, it's much trickier. This urban coyote stuff is not going away. People are talking about this more and more. It's always in the news. Like I said, I'm sure you're all seeing it. Um, and it's not going to be just coyotes, right? We've talked a little bit today about large carnivores. The longer we have these huge urban areas on the landscape, the more time we give all these different species to adapt change their behavior to evolve 
to find a way to make use of urban areas. And that was a long story about coyotes, but urban wildlife goes way beyond coyotes, right? We have an entire urban ecosystem on our back doors. And the reality of urban wildlife science is people have done studies on this or that species and this or that area, but no one's ever really tried to look at the entire urban system as a created ecosystem, an ecosystem we made where all the different parts, the animals, the people, the environment are all interacting with each other in a really complicated way that changes really quickly. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do. So I direct this uh, research center at the zoo called the Urban Wildlife Institute. We're about five years old, and we have a very simple but very ambitious goal. Our goal is to conduct the research necessary to allow humans and animals to coexist in cities around the world. Why would we care about all these animals in urban areas? Why do we have to think about coexistence? Um, well, there's a number of different reasons, uh, and one of them is conflict, right? Humans come into conflict with wildlife in cities. It's unfortunate, but it, it certainly happens. This could take the form of the rabbit that rips up your garden, the raccoon that moves into your attic, or in rare instances, the, the coyote that attacks your pet or even attacks a person, which happens once in a great while. Uh, animal vehicle collisions are another example of these sorts of conflict, right? We know that thousands of people die every year hitting animals with their cars. No one knows how many animals die because no one keeps track of that. Um, and millions and millions of dollars of damage are caused, and this could all potentially be prevented if we had a better understanding of how animals choose to cross roadways. And zoonotic disease is another major factor. These are diseases that are transmitted between wildlife and people, things like Lyme disease and West Nile virus and avian influenza. And in cities where people live at such a huge density, and often wildlife do too, we have an increased potential uh, for these kinds of incidents. So those are all bad reasons uh, to study wildlife in cities, but as some people talked about earlier, there are some potentially really positive reasons too. Most people, you know, 80% of people in this country, their first encounter with wildlife is going to be urban wildlife. And if we can make those encounters positive, if we can create a world where people and animals can relatively peacefully coexist in cities, we can really help to open people's eyes about how cool it is that no matter where you live, you live in a form of nature, you live in an ecosystem, and hopefully, uh, we can create an empathy that then extends to these rare and imperiled species also that may live halfway around the world. Our goals, uh, more specifically broken down at the Urban Wildlife Institute, we're looking to characterize how wildlife communities change as you move from urban to suburban to exurban to rural to natural areas. Uh, we really do a lot of citizen science, especially recently. Um, there's 10 million people in the Chicago metropolitan area. We would like as many of them as want to be to get involved in our research. It's helpful for us, but we are also uh, see that as part of our role to help educate people about the urban ecosystem. And we're very interested in doing applied work. We're not interested in doing research that's just going to be published in a journal somewhere. Uh, what we're interested in doing is research that's going to change the way we manage species, change the way we build cities and green space. Um, so we really are looking to have an impact on the ground. And ultimately, we want Chicago to be a model. Every city all around the world has urban wildlife, and no city anywhere around the world has a really good systematic means of dealing with those wildlife species. We would like Chicago to be the city that other cities look to when they're trying to understand how are we going to interact with all of these different animals that are making their way into these urban areas. The way we chose to get started, and really the backbone of a lot of the work that we do, is a massive urban wildlife biodiversity monitoring network that we've set up in the Chicago metro area. So along these three transects that initiate in the loop and they go out west, southwest, and northwest, uh, we have set up field monitoring stations. There's over 120 of these stations. And four times a year for a month, we monitor wildlife at all these different stations. That gives us seasonal data as far as how the wildlife change spring, summer, fall, winter. Two of these transects do follow waterways. This is the Sanitarium Ship Canal, and this is the Des Plaines River, and this one is Roosevelt Road, so that we can actually compare the effect that waterways have on wildlife as well. So this is the largest and most systematic uh, attempt to gather urban wildlife data really anywhere in the world. Uh, what we do at all these field stations, primarily we use these guys, these motion trigger cameras. These give us data on medium to large size mammals that pass in front of the cameras. Um, so that was sort of step one, but now we've expanded on that, and we also use at some sites these guys, which are bat detectors. Uh, they pick up on the ultrasonic uh, sounds that bats make, and they let us know which bat species are located at which sites. Uh, we do bird counts uh, in conjunction with a bunch of our partners who are really good at counting birds, and we've started collecting arthropods too, so we can get a sense of diversity of insects and arachnids and other things all around the city. So like I said, it's an ecosystem. All the parts are connected, and we're trying to gather data on as many different uh, species and taxa groups as we can, so that we get a sense of how does, you know, like in the talk we just heard about trophic cascades, how do trophic cascades happen in this Chicago area? 
We're really focused on four main types of habitat in Chicago. We work in forest preserves, city parks, golf courses, and cemeteries. Uh, and you may not think of golf courses and cemeteries, for example, as wildlife habitat. Some people may not even think of parks as wildlife habitat, but uh, I have a lot of data that would disagree with you in that case. We have some challenges setting up 120 <laughs> field stations uh, four times a year. We, they flood, it snows, um, we, and then we get millions of pictures of snow, which is not great. Um, and, uh, and vandalism happens, too. Uh, <laughs> these little Jedi don't look like much, but, uh, but they, can, they can do some damage, trust me. But it's all sort of part of working in an urban area. One of the things I get most excited about from the study is actually the fact that not all of our research sites look like this. This is a forest preserve where we work and that's important, but people, of course, have done wildlife surveys in the forest preserves before. I get more excited, actually, about our field sites that look like this. This is a highly, highly urban park in the city of Chicago where the camera is located almost underneath the L. Um, here's another one of those. We work in these human, these parks that are trafficked by thousands and thousands of people every day, places where no one has ever dreamed of surveying wildlife before, and yet we pick up surprising amounts of diversity sometimes. So since I, uh, since I have you stuck here, uh, this is usually the part where I like to show off some of my favorite photos from our camera. We have over a million images now in our, in our data repository, which is kind of a problem, actually. But uh, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have coyotes. We have, uh, this is a couple of coyotes in a really urban kind of area. You can see the city lights. Uh, we get deer out in the suburbs, of course. Um, foxes, although fewer foxes every year. I'm a little worried about the foxes. Uh, raccoons. Um, actually, in this picture, there's an albino raccoon. Kind of cool. Uh, of course, possum and skunk, woodchucks and beaver. That's a mink, actually. This guy's a flying squirrel. I did not think we would get them on our cameras because they're so small, but we do get them on our cameras. We get birds too. We didn't really intend to get birds on the cameras, but we do. We get turkeys and blue herons and owls and stuff, uh, woodpeckers, kind of cool. Uh, sometimes we get multi species shots. Those are always exciting to me because you get a sense of how different species may interact with each other in the wild. Like, like those again, those trophic cascades. So, this is raccoon and coyote. We have. I really enjoy how different this raccoon and this deer look. It's just kind of like, you know, so. <laughs> um, as opposed to this raccoon and this opossum who do not seem super psyched to see each other. <laughs> but not just wildlife, right? Anything that goes in front of the camera, we get a picture of it. So we get dogs and cats and uh, miscellaneous. <laughs> not quite sure how that happens. Um, and sometimes we get something that even I have trouble identifying, uh, which is the case here. <laughs> now, this, this is a person wearing a Halloween mask deliberately to mess with us. Um, and that's okay, too. Actually, something else we're doing that previous people haven't really done is we are gathering data on all these pets and all these people and our cameras. That goes into the database, too, because that's part of the system. It's a huge part of the urban system. And if you ignore the people and the pets, you're missing a big part of what may drive these wildlife around the landscape. So yeah, we've been doing this for quite a while. We have a lot of images. We have put a lot of miles on a lot of cars. And uh, we have a lot of pictures of different species, which is uh, pretty exciting. But um, now what? What do, you, what do you do with a million pictures of urban animals? Um, it turns out we can actually ask and answer a lot of interesting scientific questions. Uh, I made this map to answer the question that people used to ask me all the time, which species is the most urban? So we created this map where all these different colored lines indicate how far into the city we've detected different species. Uh, with, like, for example, raccoons and coyotes, super urban, foxes and skunks more sort of restricted to the suburbs a little bit. This is cool, but what I think is going to be cooler is that over time I'm going to update this map. We're going to see how these lines move, which species may be penetrating further into the urban core, and which might be being pushed out. This is a similar sort of map, which is activity patterns. So what times of the day or night are different species most active? That's what these lines represent. You can sort of see like skunks get really active about 1 AM, and then they crash, whereas red fox get real active about 3. Um, are they avoiding each other? We don't know. But these kinds of graphs help us to develop hypotheses that we can test. I made this map to answer the question of where do we have the most diversity around Chicago. So the size of the red circle is how many species we've detected at that site. This is pretty cool, for example, if we're thinking about which natural areas may need restoration, where we can allocate conservation dollars, uh, things of that nature. 
We can look for changes um, between seasons. So this is two different seasons, uh, a fall and then a following winter, and how many coyotes we saw at a site based on how big that green circle is. And for example, you can see tons of coyotes right here uh, near downtown in the fall and then almost none in the winter. So we can actually look to ask questions like that. Are, are species using different parts of the city seasonally? And this is pretty nerdy. I really just put this in here for a little science cred, but we do a lot of these um, regressions where we look to see specifically what factors of a, of a neighborhood may attract or repel certain species. So this is one where we were looking at skunks, and I was looking to see what's the relationship between skunks and suburban development, so medium density urban development. And what we see is that the more suburban a neighborhood is, uh, the more skunks you get there. And I really just put this in here for illustration because what I wanted to tell you is that I, I spend a lot of time doing this kind of thing over and over and over for all different species with all the different factors I can measure so that I can make a table like this one where I can actually learn what are those key things that each species is looking for. This is really, really important, right? If we want to know how to build a smarter city where we repel the species we don't want, where we attract the species we do want, we need to know what is it that each individual species is looking for when they set up their habitat. So this is a table I'm constantly updating, trying to understand what are those key factors uh, that, are, that are specific to each species so that we can do better management. And sometimes we learn things we weren't really thinking about. Um, I wasn't really thinking about the role of buckthorn in affecting wildlife species, but we did a little analysis and we found out that actually, I mean, we knew that invasive buckthorn, of course, really affects plant communities, but we didn't really know if that trickled down to the animal community, and we were able to prove that using these camera data. In the sites that are invaded by buckthorn, we have more coyotes, we have fewer deer, we have more opossums, and it sort of trickles down from there. So um, having this huge database enables us to test these hypotheses pretty much as soon as they occur to us. So one thing I did want to talk about, that's sort of the backbone of what we do, but we do tons and tons of projects. I don't have time to tell you about all of them, but I did want to talk about our reintroduction biology program because it does relate uh, to rewilding, right? The idea of rewilding, if we build it, they will come. Um, they don't always. Sometimes the animals are very small. It's hard for them to get around. Sometimes they need a little help. So we've actually been working with Lake County and McHenry County Forest Preserves uh, to try to do a reintroduction of some of the forest preserves that have been restored, but these animals, these locally rare animals, haven't found them yet. We started off with these guys, the smooth green snake. Uh, it's a state species of special concern. And so what we do is we trap them where they're abundant. We bring them into the zoo where we have animal care staff, we have veterinarians and zookeepers who are so good at getting animals to breed in captivity. We grow them up to a certain size and then we release them back into the wild. Uh, this has been incredibly successful. We really have increased the population of these guys over the last three years or so. Uh, so much so that we have expanded to now we're doing a, a project with these guys too, the meadow jumping mouse. Um, we're also kind of in trouble. This is a newer project, but we are uh, successfully breeding them in captivity. A few of them have been released in the wild, not so many just yet, but we're working on that. And then we're going to actually move on to phase three, which will be the least weasel. Um, we have not actually caught enough least weasels yet to uh, affect any useful reintroduction. But this is a place I think really where zoos have the part to play in rewilding, right? Zoos are sort of the ideal place to do captive breeding and reintroduction because we have so many people on staff, so much space for animals, and we know exactly how to get that done. And we're also very interested in uh, management of wildlife. How do people manage wildlife and, and is it effective? And uh, this is a project we did looking at translocation. Translocation is a fancy science word for if you have an animal in your front yard or something and you don't want it there, but you don't want to kill it, so you hire somebody, a guy usually, to come trap it and take it out to the country and let it go, right? And then you feel better. Uh, but we have no idea what happens to that animal. No one does. So does it just die instantly? Does it create new conflict with new humans? Does it try to get back to where it was? You know, can an urban adapted animal actually survive in a rural area? So we're trying to answer these questions, and we chose to use woodchucks as our as our study guys. So these are these woodchucks in there. So these are nuisance woodchucks. They were bothering someone, and then someone from a company came to take them to the country. But along the way, we just implant a little transmitter in them so that we can find out what happens to them. And all sorts of things happen to them. Um, this is an adult male who was released and is doing great. He's still alive, he didn't really move around. He's hibernating like right where they left him. Um, so he's fine. This is an adult female who was released and never really got comfortable, ran all over the place, covered actually almost four miles, which is a long way for a little woodchuck, ended up hit by a car and killed. So what we're trying to understand is what was it that caused that male to do well, this female to not do well, so that we can actually determine when translocation makes sense and when it doesn't. When we look at what kills these translocated animals, actually the, the primary cause is predation. They're being eaten mostly by coyotes. So again, it's the whole ecosystem, right? You can't just look at the woodchucks, you have to look at the whole system, because we might just be creating 
an all-you-can-eat woodchuck buffet for a couple of coyotes, right? And like, oh, they're disoriented. They don't even know where they are. And so these are the sorts of things we should probably know about. As I said, we do a lot of other projects. We're doing a bird diversity survey all around Chicago. Um, we're actually doing a lot of tick surveys around looking at Lyme disease and other diseases so we can actually uh, warn people when there's disease risk in the forest preserves and things. We do work in Denver, working on prairie dogs still. We just finished up a project in New York City where we were working on feral cats. So um, we have a pretty big reach and I'll be happy to talk to you about those other projects maybe over lunch if you have questions. But because the theme today is rewilding, I wanted to finish by talking about Nature Boardwalk. I don't know how many of you know about Nature Boardwalk, but it's the 14-acre uh, urban wetland ecosystem that's been created about five years ago just south of Lincoln Park Zoo uh, that we actually manage. Um, so this used to be called South Pond. Again, I don't know how many of you know this, but it used to be called South Pond. It looked like this. It's a paddle boat pond, um, concrete lined, really nothing naturalistic about it at all. Um, but the decision was made to, to spend a pretty great amount of money to completely change this. All the concrete was torn out. The pond was, was greatly deepened. The entire site's been replanted with native plants. Um, this is an old picture. The plants are super tall now. It's really, really pretty out there. If you haven't been to, to Nature Boardwalk, I really recommend that you check it out because it really is an indication of what you can do in an urban space uh, with enough time and energy uh, to create something that's really pretty cool. And so one of the things we track out there pretty regularly is birds, of course, because we're on a migratory pathway. The birds are discovering the site every year. We're detecting a lot more new species that discover Nature Boardwalk and are, are using it as part of that migratory path, which is great. Um, and then a thing happened where one of my staff members actually found this book in an antique store called Wild Birds and City Parks. It turns out to have been written by a married couple in the 1890s who counted birds in Lincoln Park. Um, and they were pretty uh, specific about how and when they did that, uh, to the point that we were actually able to recreate their techniques. So uh, we counted birds in the exact same way that they did in the 1890s, but now. And we looked to see what have been the major changes to the bird community. How is, how is 100 plus years of urbanization modified? Uh, the birds at Lincoln Park. Um, and it was pretty interesting. Some of the species haven't changed much, as you might expect. Robins were incredibly common historically, still very common today. Same with grackles. But they saw blue jays and dark-eyed junco all the time, and we never see them, almost never. So there have been some important changes, and this can help us sort of key in on some species that may need uh, special management attention, for example, maybe the cavity nesters and things of that nature. But another major focus at Nature Boardwalk is these guys, the black crowned night heron. Someone mentioned earlier, it's a state endangered species. Their largest remaining colony in Illinois is actually in the in Lincoln Park and to a small extent in Nature Boardwalk right next door. So you know, here we have this uh, species, this endangered species that is choosing to make its home in the heart of Chicago in this incredibly urban landscape. And they're doing great. We see more of them each and every year. So it, it doesn't seem like this urbanization is having a negative effect on them. And I love the story of the herons because when I talk about urban wildlife all the time, people say to me, well, you know, it's great if you care about squirrels, but uh, we're never going to conserve a rare species in an urban landscape. Well, the, the night herons are sort of proving that we can. It's not easy, and we probably can't do it for all species, but we can make a place for these rare and imperiled species in the heart of a city uh, if it's something that we care to do, and I, I think it's worth doing. I mentioned that we're doing a lot of citizen science. I uh, kind of need to do a shameless plug here. So I told you a million photos, a million images of urban wildlife. It turns out we cannot keep up with that much data. I, I can't hire enough interns to tell me what animals are in each photo. They cannot go through and tag them. We're like a year behind. So to solve this problem, we actually teamed up with a group called Zooniverse, which is housed partly at Adler Planetarium. And they do use citizen science to help researchers that have too much data. That's sort of their, their job. And they did this with a project called Snapshot Serengeti to help some people who had the same problem with Serengeti camera trap images. Um, so that basically anyone in the world can log on and they can help people identify animals in photos. So we worked together to create something very similar. This is the interface that you'll see if you go to the website. You'll see a picture, hopefully, of an animal. And then uh, there's field guides and things to help you identify the animal. And uh, this is something that's been doing pretty well. And if any of you, if this, if any of you want to be part of our project and you have 30 seconds, you can help me with my project. I would love it. Please go to ChicagoWildlifeWatch.org. Um, I think it's pretty fun. A lot of people seem to think it's it's pretty fun, and we would we would really like to help. Another citizen science project we're doing is called Partners in Fieldwork. This is a project where we go out to local high schools and we give them all the equipment that we use to monitor wildlife. We give them motion-triggered cameras, bat monitors, binoculars for bird counting, 
uh, all of that. We train them how to count and, and monitor wildlife, and we set them loose to count wildlife from around the vicinity of their, of their high school. And this is sort of a win-win, right? We get more data. We have an extra data point now, which is their high school. But also, we're helping train the next generation of urban wildlife biologists, which, as we talked about earlier, is, is really important. We're going to have an increasing focus on zoonotic disease in the future. We actually have a full-time wildlife disease ecologist now, so her job is going to be to predict areas where animals and humans might exchange diseases and help prevent that from happening. So that's pretty exciting, I think. Um, but I also want to continue to apply science to management whenever we can. I love that image before of the, the overpass over uh, I-70, the, the theoretical wildlife overpass. Um, I did a little analysis from that coyote I showed you earlier to see where was she choosing to cross Lakeshore Drive, right? If we had this kind of analysis from a bunch of animals, uh, especially as they're going to uh, do the reconstruction of Lakeshore Drive, we could do some smart things, right? We could build some underpasses, we could put in signs, we could, we could do a lot of things, but we've got to get involved in the ground floor. As we continue to think about doubling the amount of green space in Chicago by 2040, which I think is a great idea, it's going to be great for people, it's going to be great for wildlife, but I just think we really need to infuse that process with some understanding of animal behavior, urban wildlife ecology, uh, because if we double the amount of wildlife in the area, we don't just want to double the amount of conflict, right? We actually want to do it in a smart way that allows for people and animals to coexist. Because our world is not going to suddenly start getting less urban. I think we all know that we're, our planet is going to continue to urbanize. And to me, what that means is that our solution to our biodiversity crisis is, is not really to continue to try to focus on those dwindling, pristine areas, but to think about how do we make cities part of the solution for biodiversity and not just part of the problem. And that's really what we're trying to do. I always try to remember this quote from Aldo Leopold, the weeds in a city lot convey the same lesson as the redwoods. Uh, we can learn a lot from our wildlife neighbors right around where we live, but we also have to remember that they're not very well understood, and uh, there's a lot more that's, that we need to do in terms of science and, and basic understanding in order to create that world. So uh, with that, if there's time, I'll be happy to, uh, to take your questions. Yeah, we do um, monitor some feral cats around the city. We have never captured a feral dog or a dog we could definitively state was feral on a, on a camera. Uh, people warn me about them all the time, like packs of roaming dogs. I have never encountered that. Cats are out there, though, and they're, they're having an impact on birds, for sure. I mean, we, we know that. Um, it's something that I would like to study a little more closely. We did do a study in, in New York looking to see whether you can control their populations with sterilization. It was not very effective there. Um, but I think that it's an issue that, uh, that needs some more investigation. There's some good data on that on the PAWS Chicago website also. Just, uh, yeah. Was it surprising to you the range of that coyote along Lake Michigan? Or the yeah, it was. Um, not stunning, I guess. I mean, there's video footage of them crossing roads and, you know, they'll look both ways and they kind of use lights and they're, they're really smart about the way they, they move around. and. Uh, you know, these are animals that need a lot of prey, and they, they're willing to roam along ways to get it. So, um, a little bit surprising, but uh, not, not really shocking. Yeah? Um, I, I'm really curious about this um, sort of green infrastructure vision for Chicago wilderness, and then the, the sort of coyote um, movement preferences, and if there's been any um, further discussion on like trying to overlay those maps and prioritize land acquisition better. Um, as you were talking about, like to promote this sort of strategic wildlife and habitat corridors, or if it needs more research yeah. and development. So, I mean, we're trying to get as involved as we can in the planning process for, for all of that. Um, you know, as it is, I get consulted sort of sometimes, uh, but I would, I would like for me, myself and my staff to be more at the table for those kinds of discussions. Um, but yeah, I think you're right that coyotes are important, but it, it's not really just coyotes either, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the entire, the entire wildlife ecosystem. And when you're talking about connectivity, it's very species specific as far as your spatial scale and how wide those corridors have to be and how long they can be and all of that. It's, it's really complicated. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's the kind of conversations that should be going on. Yeah. Um, are there any other sources of historic data Yeah, there's quite a bit of historic bird data. I know that we stumbled upon a database from the 40s at the uh, uh, Notre Dame Museum that they had. 
uh, and I'm sure there's more out there. You know, people have been bird counting we're, we're forever. Things other, birds, so. things other than birds, it's trickier, right? When you go back far enough, you're talking about trapping records, and those are kind of a very different sort of data. Um, so I would say much patchier for mammals and probably almost nothing for herbs or insects, things like that. Oh, I just want to give a plug to everyone to the Chicago Wildlife Watch. Um, I've actually done the Serengeti one. I didn't know you were giving your eyes to it too. It's completely fun and amazing. You really have to do it. And after 15 minutes, you're waiting for the butt sound. It's great. And it's helpful. And it's, it, and it's completely amazing. You're like, oh, what is it? It's like a little shadow of the part of an animal, and you're trying to work it out. It's, I just really recommend it. I think I'll try to it. It's close to a video game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like this. <laughs> yeah. So I live in uptown and we have um, had a number of coyotes coming back and forth up and down um, the west side of, of between the two cemeteries and the theory is that they're living in the cemeteries to the north and south essentially. Um, there's a lot of neighbors who want to Live with the coyotes, and of course, there's other. And you're, you're saying coyotes, don't you? Not coyotes. It's it's regional. They're both correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any suggestions on this? Like at this point in time, how to suggest to neighbors how to lend the coyotes for coyotes? Um, don't leave cat food outside and enjoy. Those are kind of like two <laughs> suggestions. You can't get rid of them. They're everywhere. There's no neighborhood where they aren't. So. I think we're with the coyotes, we're past talking about should they be here or not, they are here. So now it's sort of, you know, how do we how do we coexist with them? And 99 plus percent of those coyotes are no problem to anyone. And every once in a great while, you do get those nuisance animals. With those less than 1% nuisance animals, I'd say 90 plus percent of those have been being fed by someone. So, you know, that's a key message to get out there. Do not feed coyotes, it's a bad idea. Um, and yeah, don't leave, you know, a lot of people feed these outdoor cats and when the coyotes really enjoy that, that cat food, so I, I don't like it when people put that out. Yeah, something to add? Well, how many coyotes live within the Chicago city proper on any given time? Yeah, and I don't have data on that, but the best estimate from uh, Dr. Garrett is uh, he thinks there's 3,000 coyotes in Cook County. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You mentioned in brief passing the decline in stock population. Can mm -hmm. you explain that? Yeah, so. The, the gray fox seem to be largely gone. We have one detection of a gray fox over the last five years in the city. Uh, and then as far as the red fox, every year we see fewer. Um, and it seems like the coyotes are out competing them. That seems like the most reasonable explanation, although I can't directly prove that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm slightly concerned about the, about the foxes. Yeah? Um, I live in suburban area, Evanston, mm -hmm. the red population has exploded. Mm -hmm. They, they may help in time. A lot of people have been asking about the rabbit population being, it seems elevated this year to a lot of people. Um, my best guess is that it may have to do with the sort of harsh winter that we had because rabbits are sort of, they sort of reproduce uh, you know, more when there's resource availability. So maybe that the numbers of most things dropped in the winter, the rabbits were able to quickly reproduce and take advantage of that. Now there's rabbits everywhere and if we give it a little time, predators and things may, should catch up. But uh, yeah, those rabbits, we uh, <laughs> have been doing a project at the zoo trying to find a repellent that will work to keep rabbits out of our garden. We cannot find one, so um, they're, they're tricky. Um, the, the data that, that a dream application that I could use all these data on? Um, well, I mean, like I said, sort of my, my dream is to continue to generate these complex uh, predictors of which species we found where and then integrate that into all of the, all the planning for green infrastructure and things. But my, my wider dream than that actually is if we're gonna get to the sort of, what in my mind is the holy grail of urban wildlife, which is to get at universal principles of how different animals distribute in cities, what we need is a parallel design, a design like what we're doing, but in other cities around the country so we can actually start to see, okay, which of these things are city specific and which are generally true of urban areas. So that's actually something I've been working on a lot lately is talking to other people about trying to set up um, the same kind of research design, but in other cities. All right.
Thank you.